Jack, welcome to the Save by Nostalgia Nightmare on Elm Street Part 2 retrospective. How's everything going? How are you holding up during these kind of crazy times? Everything's on Zoom now, so here we are. This right. is our new world. <laughs> right. Well, well, aside from my cough that started when I got off the cruise ship, I'm, I'm fine. No, oh, well, just kidding. No. <laughs> um, well, you know, as, as we kind of get started here and delve in to a film that uh, impacted both of us so much as, as kids and oh, yeah. to, to, to kind of look at the, the, the impact and, and what it was, I kind of want to start at the beginning for you because you worked, you already worked for New Line uh, when this film project came to be. Just take us back to that. You were kind of working in the editing department, doing trailers, and you'd already directed a film, but kind of take us back to the genesis of your involvement in uh, Nightmare 2. Uh, well, um, well, they didn't really have an editing department, but I, I uh, 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 they would hire me from time to time to do editing work for them. So, so I cut almost all their trailers. I, I, one point I tried to count them up and I, I got into the eighties and that was all that I could remember, but I, you know, I probably did more, but um, you know, I did trailers for like uh, the street fighter, the street fighter two tattooed Hitman, um, um slave of the cannibal gods. <laughs> uh, 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 plus, plus, actually, some some uh, some good movies. A lot of the John Waters movies, some of uh, Werner Herzog's movies. Um, I did I did a lot of trailers for them. You know, in between my other editing work, um, and uh, the first trailer that I ever did was was for them. Uh, I I just gotten out of college and I made some films in college, and a friend of mine told me that I should go see them. Maybe they would uh, be interested in distributing a short film that I had done. So I, I, I dropped it off, and uh, a few weeks later, I got a call back from, from Bob Shea. And at, at, at that point, the company was like four people in an office yeah. above a bar, you know, in, 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 in downtown uh, New York. And um, uh, he said that, you know, shorts were not exactly a hot – a hot subject to distribute, but, um, you know, thank you very much. And as I was leaving, he said, by the way, do you know anybody who, who could cut a trailer for us? And I said, yeah, me. So, cause I had started working as, as an editor. Um, you know, I, I was just getting started, but he said, okay. And he hired me and we, we, we basically rented somebody's editing room for the weekend and locked ourselves in and didn't come out until, you know, like 48 hours later. And by that point we were friends. So, so I had a long association with, with, with Bob Shea and, and New Line. So I knew everybody there. And, uh, you know, like I said, I cut a lot of their trailers, you know, I kind of knew everybody who was working there and everything that, that they were doing. And I ended up doing their first, uh, film that they actually produced themselves when they decided to move from strictly distribution into production called Alone in the Dark. Um, and it didn't exactly set the world on, on fire, unfortunately. And um, um, I think it's a lot more appreciated now than it was back, back when I made it. Although I actually went back and it, 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 got, pretty, it got pretty good reviews, you know, but it, it was sort of a hybrid because it was, it, was, it was, I mean, I was basically trying to make an art film in the guise of making a slasher film. <laughs> um, and, and I'm not sure that it, 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 it sort of fell in between the, the two genres. And, um, you know, now I think pe people appreciate it for what it is. But uh, so um, I got more work as a writer. And, and I also, I, I edited the first film that, that the Weinstein brothers did called The Burning, um, which, where I kind of learned a lot about how horror films work. And then Wes was supposed to do Nightmare 2. But he never, he didn't write the screenplay. You know, it was written by Dave Chaskin, who was, who was you know, part of the staff, you know, at, at New Line Cinema. But he was a writer, and I guess he, he came up with a good pitch that they liked. And basically, they were interested in getting a film out that was called Nightmare on Elm Street 2. And they didn't really much care what it was, as long as it had Freddy Krueger in it and it had the, the title. They figured they could squeeze a few more bucks out of the title because they were not expecting that it was going to make, you know, it's not like now where the sequel is always like bigger and better and makes more, more money. You know, back, back then it was cheaper and worse and you know, <laughs> made less money. Um, and that was, that was the whole idea. And, and Wes never really 
I mean, Elm Street was, was his baby. It really came out of his, his brain and his, his psyche. And Elm Street, too, first of all, you know, it broke, you know, one of the cardinal rules, which is that Freddie only appears in your dreams. And, and I don't think he, he never really uh, liked the script. And New Line didn't want to really change it. And he had better things to do. So he bailed about six weeks while they were already in, like, early stages of pre-production. He, he bailed. And, and they needed somebody. So they knew me. They, they trusted me. You know, I, 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 I was very familiar with the film because I had read an early script and I'd read a later script. And, and I had... Um, you were, uh, you when were I say I was involved in the editing, I don't mean that I had anything to do with the editing, but I, you know, I was in the editing room. I made a few comments. I helped them uh, cut a temp music track for screening and stuff like that. So, you know, I was, I was pretty familiar with, with the project. So I guess they figured, well, uh, let's, let's see if Jack wants to do it. So they offered it to me. My, my, my first reaction was no, because I didn't want to do another horror film. Um, I didn't want to do a sequel to somebody else's horror film. Uh, and a friend of mine told me that I was crazy, that the film was going to make a lot of money and that that would assure me of a career as a film director. And that's exactly what happened. So, so that's how I got involved. And, and you weren't necessarily a huge fan of the original either. So Not, well, I, I thought it was a great idea. I thought, Freddy Krueger was a great character and I thought it was brilliant to cast a real actor because, you know, at, at that point, uh, 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 you know, there was this, this, this whole renaissance of, of, of horror films, you know, Texas Chainsaw and Friday the 13th and, and, and uh, um, um, Halloween and they were all making money. And, but the, the killer, was you know and, and and even like in 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 the burning the killer was was basically a, like a stunt guy who would jump up and kill people and then disappear whereas um in elm street the the freddy was a real character who was played by a really fine actor who who, who brought a lot to the role so, so so i thought that was great i honestly didn't think the filmmaking was was particularly good i mean I thought Wes's new nightmare, he's a much, much better filmmaker at that point. But so, yeah. So I wasn't intimidated about, um, you know, trying to, to, to follow in, 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 in Wes's footsteps. And, and, and obviously, you know, New Line didn't really care about that either. Otherwise they would have, you know, you know, tried to sort of redo the, the template from the first one. And kind of interestingly, you start Nightmare 2, without Robert England involved. Um, I, I, yeah, I, it hired a stunt guy who lumbered around like Frankenstein. Apparently it wasn't working out. What, what, uh, what was your thoughts? And you were the one I think that said, we've got to get Robert in here. <laughs> like, right. Well, all right. Well, first of all, let's, let, let's clear it up. It wasn't the stunt guy. Okay. That would have been too elevated. It was an extra who fit the <laughs> costume. It could have been you. It could have been anybody who, who was like, you know, a, a 40 regular. Uh, you know, that was basically the uh, criterion. Somebody who would basically have a similar physical uh, stature as Freddie and who would fit the costume and, 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 and who would fit the, the makeup. Um, so when I got on the film, I said, are you bringing Robert England back? And they said, well, his, his agent, his agent wants more money for the second film. And we, you know, we think he's taking advantage of us and he's, you know, how dare him ask for more money for the second one. And so they said that they would, um, that they weren't going to hire him unless his agent was willing to, to make the deal. Um, and I said, I think that's kind of a mistake. I mean, nobody really knew at that point that, that the thing was really all about Freddie. Um, you know, if you look at the original poster for Elm Street 2, there's no Freddie in the poster. You know, uh, there's there's Mark and Kim, and there's like a, a, a weird bird in the background, and there's the, like the Freddie claw, but there's no Freddie. 
Um, so they had no idea that that's really what it was all about, but they kind of suspected that he was good in the role and that might be a good idea. And the fact is that um, they hadn't done any casting. So, so when I got involved, you know, immediately we, we started casting, but we never saw anybody to read for the role of Freddie. So, so my guess is that, that they were just kind of like playing hardball, but they figured, you know, they would see what they could get and, and, and make a deal. So they, uh, you know, like about two weeks before we were ready to start shooting, um, the, the, the head of production came up to me and said, well, we made a deal with, with Robert, but um, unfortunately he's not available the first week because he had booked another, another job. So, so we just had that one scene in the shower where there's just a one shot where he comes walking out of the shower. And that was the guy who was basically just, like I said, he wasn't even a stunt man. I mean, he was just, you know, a guy like, you know, like Jimmy Kimmel picks off the street, you know, and <laughs> gives him a role. So, so that's it. So, I mean, somewhere, I, I mean, I don't know if the guy is even still alive, but I mean, somewhere there's a guy maybe who said, hey, I was, I was ready in Nightmare on Elm Street too. <laughs> um, so in this movie, Freddy Krueger feels a lot meaner down to, I mean, his look and his dialogue, um, was that, was that you or was that the screenwriter or who, who, whose decision was that to really kind of make him a little bit meaner than in the first movie? Uh, well, that was, um, well, that was a little bit of everybody. I, I mean, it was basically New Line's decision. So, um, that, that, um, that I'm sure that they passed on to Dave Chaskin, the writer, and, and really they, the only thing that they told me that I had to do was keep Freddy dark and keep him scary. You know, um, don't, you know, don't ever light up his face too much. I mean, part of that was they never liked the makeup in, in the original one. And, and so we, we hired this young guy who, you know, who was just getting started, Kevin Yeager. You know, I had seen, you know, we were looking for somebody and I had seen his, um, his um, book that showed all his stuff. And I said, this guy's really an artist. He's, he's really, you know, he's not just a schlockmeister, but he's, he's a really, you know, he's, he's a fine artist. And because Freddie is a real character, he's not just a monster, but he's, you know, he's, he's a character that I felt that we needed somebody like, like that. So, so he redid the makeup. Everybody at Newland was very happy with the makeup, but they, they wanted to keep him dark and scary and mysterious. So, I mean, I didn't write any of his lines. All the lines were in the script, you know. Um, uh, I don't know whether, I don't, think he, I don't think he improvised anything. I mean, it's possible, but um, I mean, we, we pretty much shot the script. Yeah, you, I so, read it. And, and, and uh, the look of the film, uh, just just in keeping it dark, we had the same cameraman who shot the original Elm Street. So so he was you know he he was pretty familiar with the genre and and um, you know with my own tastes as as a filmmaker, like I think he was able to to go a little further in the direction that he might have wanted to go. And, and maybe there was a, a little bit more more money, which meant he had a little bit more more time to kind of finesse the the lighting and the look. Um, so yeah, so that that that's basically it was it was kind of a combination, but it was all sort of came out of you know that that's how New Line wanted to portray him. Then of course after um, the success of Elm Street Two, and when they realized when they saw it with an audience that that the audience just went wild whenever he appeared. And, and in fact, um, they hired a publicist um, while we were editing the film to try to, you know, market the film and build up interest. And he said, hey, hey, I've got this great idea that um, we're going to say Freddie is the scariest man in America. And they're just going to make this up. Apparently, there, there was like the University of Minnesota had done some poll of who was the scariest man in America. And... and and, and, and somebody said Freddy Krueger. So, so he decided to push the idea. And in fact, they, they scheduled a midnight screening where they claimed that people were showing up at screenings dressed as Freddy Krueger. 
<laughs> and so they scheduled a midnight screening and they invited the press and they hired people to dress up as Freddy Krueger to try to promote that idea. And what happened was a bunch of people showed up that they never hired who also dressed up as Freddy Krueger. And they had just made the whole thing up. So, so they started to realize that there was a phenomenon going on here. You know, and then obviously when they, when they redid the, 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 the poster uh, and the, the box, Freddy is prominently on it. And then, you know, and all the rest of the, uh, the series, you know, Freddy's very prominent. Yeah, I just, uh, I just rewatched the movie on Blu-ray um, a few days ago, and it, it, does, it looks beautiful. The cinematography and the lighting is, is really good. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask, yeah. you, um, did you already storyboard the entire film, or did you just show up on set and, and kind of uh, come up with it as you went? What was your process on set? I, um, well, I don't storyboard. Uh, well, I, I storyboard like everybody does, if they're special effects, because um, the special effects people have to put an appliance on and blood is going to come out, so they need to know, can I hide the thing here, or can I hide, you know, is, are, are you going to shoot it from the right, are you going to shoot it from the left, are you going to shoot it from the front, so that they can figure out how to do it. So you, you have to do storyboards for, for those things. And there were some things that were shot by second unit, and we storyboarded those uh, because, um, you know, I wasn't going to be there and I wanted to make sure that they shot it the way I wanted it to be shot. Um, but w what I do do is I shot list everything. So it's basically a verbal description. Mm -hmm. So I would say um, uh, a slightly low angle, medium close up of Jack's shoulder with a bookcase in the background. <laughs> it's know. a good shot. Uh, <laughs> And, and so it takes me about 10 seconds to type that out. If I were to storyboard it, I don't draw. Yeah. Um, so I'd have to get a storyboard artist in. I'd have to explain the shot to the storyboard artist. He'd, he'd, he'd then do a storyboard. He'd then come back. I'd say, no, it's not quite the way I had. Can you make it a little? And then he'd do it again. And it's a goddamn pain in the ass. <laughs> so I really don't like doing storyboards. Plus, um, it's... The, the, a shot list is conceptual. So this shot is a conceptual shot. It's a slightly, you know, it's a slightly low angle shot with a wide angle lens. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's what we call a bow tie shot. For, um, you know, because you can see if I had a bow tie on. Um, and, and that's the concept of, of the shot. And then it's up to the cameraman to sort of finesse it and really, you know, or, or it's up to us when, when we're shooting to really uh, make that shot as good as possible. Or, or we might even decide there's a better way to shoot it when we, when we get there. But making the shot list forces me to think the whole thing through. Because I have to say, what's the scene about? Who's the scene about? How do I want to shoot this in order to convey what I think is 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 what the scene is about? Um, I, you know, do I want to use some crazy angles, or do I want to just shoot it very straightforward? Do I want to shoot it in a bunch of shots? I want to shoot it in one big master shot. I mean, uh, so I kind of have to go through the process of conceptualizing what every scene is about. So, so basically, every film I've ever done, I have shot listed the entire film before I ever started to shoot. And then I would say that I probably shoot 80% of what I shot list. It, it's rare that I'll completely change something. Um, but it's, it's often that I'll make minor changes. Well, let's kind of talk about the casting a little bit. We were uh, supposed to have um, Mark Patton with us today. He wasn't feeling well. We're hoping to right. do something with him. He's a fellow Kansas Cityan. Uh, so we got that going. Hello, Mark. Hope you're doing better, buddy. Um, Mark, you cast Mark Patton, and kind of legend has it that you turned down um, Brad Pitt and Christian Slater for Mark Patton. If that's not the ultimate uh, coup for Mark, uh, the ultimate flattery for the rest of his life, I don't know what is. Talk to, talk to us about the casting of Mark uh, as Jesse in the film. Well, um, I've heard that rumor too, and um, I... I went back because I, um, I mean, when you do casting, uh, 
uh, you come in and the casting director has a sheet or sheets that has the, the, the time, you know, 10 o'clock, Mark Patton, Jesse, with the name of his agent, um, you know, and each one is sort of scheduled in. And it says, you know, who they are and what role they're reading for and, um, you know, who their agent is. And I went through and I did not see Brad Pitt on any of the sheets that I had, which isn't to say that, that he might have been on another sheet that I didn't have. It's very possible. But, but I don't know. Um, you know, if I had cast Brad Pitt, it would have been a very different movie. And I yeah. think that the... the, the um, uh, a lot of the um, um, the uh, reputation that it's gotten uh, as the gayest horror movie of all time, or or, or whatever that is, uh, probably would not have stuck as much, you know, if 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 there'd been, you know, somebody who was very very masculine, you know, uh, you know, a, a Brad Pitt kind of character in that role, it would have changed the dynamic of the film. Um, when I, when I read, um, you know, I never went to film school. I was an English major in college and, 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 and before that I had studied music. So, so nobody ever taught me how to do this. You know, I just kind of did it by doing it, you know, and I'd also been an editor. So as an editor, you, you really understand how a film gets put together and you make a lot of choices and, you you do become a connoisseur of performance because you know you're the one who who picks the takes to go in which isn't to say that the director that, that doesn't then come in and say hey you know let's let's see what other takes we have you know but um you know uh, a lot of the the performances are really shaped by by the editor so i think that i intuitively knew that the character needed to have a lot of vulnerability um because, you know, basically, uh, Jesse is, is like the final girl, you know, um, and, and needs to have a lot of vulnerability, needs to be someone who, who gets bullied. I mean, you can't really imagine Brad Pitt getting bullied much, uh, you know, and, and he's a good enough actor that he could have pulled it off. But, um, so, but, but Mark had that kind of vulnerability. Um, and he was my first cho- he was my my clear first choice and everyone in new line uh, you know when you when you do casting you have like 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 these callbacks and final callbacks and the final callbacks for the important roles you know somebody from the studio is there and everybody agreed that that mark was the right guy for the role you know he was very good looking you know he's very cute uh you know all the girls, you know, were in love with Johnny Depp from the first one, and they thought he kind of had a Johnny Depp quality to him. You know, I mean, Johnny Depp is very pretty. He's a pretty guy, you know, and, and Mark also is a pretty guy. Um, uh, um, I'm, I mean, Johnny Depp has very, very fine, almost, almost feminine kind of, kind of features, you know, and Mark had a similar kind of a, a look and a similar kind of a vibe. So, and... Um, the fact that he was gay, it, it wasn't even, it didn't even enter the conversation. It never even occurred to me to even think along those, you know, it's like, well, was his grandfather from Yugoslavia? I mean, you know, I, I don't care. Uh, you know, I never thought about any of that stuff. You know, I didn't think about, oh, he's from Kansas, you know. Uh, I just thought, this guy's really feels like he's the right guy for the role. And, 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 and he was also, uh, he had a lot of heat coming in. He had a good agent, um, and uh, I, you know, he seemed like like somebody who was really, you know, on, on the rise. A lot of people, you know, credit this film, uh, us included, for, for taking the series in a different direction. It really, you know, you could say it zigged when you thought it was going to zag. You, there's a, there's a documentary uh, called um, Screen Queen that features um, Mark Patton and kind of his experience sure. with the film and. Uh, I mean, ever since right. then, you probably in every interview you do, you hear gay, homoerotic, gayest film ever, gay subtext, homoerotic, s and You hear that from years and years. Like, is that, when you look back on it, is that, do you kind of get tired of hearing about that side of the film? Or is it like, hey, we made a ballsy statement here, and we are standby taking the series in a direction that 
no one could have foreseen. I think that's a, that's a good thing. Well, well, first of all, we weren't trying to take the series in, 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 in any direction. Yeah. We were just trying, New Line just wanted to make a sequel that would capitalize on Elm Street 2. Uh, their, their head of distribution, uh, you know, who was this cigar-smoking old-time guy, you know, who knew the name of every drive-in along the Mississippi, you know. I mean, he, you know, he knew the, every drive-in in America. He could, he could tell you what their weekly grosses were and every, you know, he was, he was one of those, those kind of guys. And he said, uh, you know, if we can do 70% of what the original film made, we'll be satisfied. You know, if we can do better than that, great. Of course, we ended up, you know, doing about 150% of, of what the original one made. Um, but, and, and, and then there was the hope, well, you know, if things go really well, maybe we can even squeeze a third one out of this. You know, but it was like, you know, Elm Street, Elm Street 2, Elm Street 3, Elm Street, you know, <laughs> it would just like the quality and the grosses would, would, would go down with, with each one that they, what they, that, that they put out, which is sort of kind of the opposite. So, so, I mean, there was never this, this idea that we had to follow a template, that, that we had this whole series that we were the guardians of. You know, there was none of that. It was just like, uh, you know, and, and normally I have a fair amount of input into the script and most of the films that I've worked on, we, we, we work on the script uh, sometimes considerably before we shoot. In, in, in this case, there wasn't any time to do any of that. I mean, you know, I was handed a, a sheet with like uh, seven single space pages of special effects none of which I had the slightest idea how to do. I mean, I, you know, I, I panicked. I had no idea how to make this fucking movie, you know, uh, and find the sets and cast it. And I had six weeks and, you know, I was living in New York, but we were shooting in California. And, you know, there were all these, these, these things that were just kind of terrifying. It was like, you know, you got to climb Mount Everest in six weeks, so you better get, get ready. So, so there really was, you know, so basically my job was to do the best possible job that I could with the script that I had. And, you know, obviously I have, you know, pretty strong feelings about how to shoot a movie and about what I like. And, 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 and I have a, I mean, Wes, Wes was never really famous for having a great sense of humor, but, um, you know, I, I, I have a pretty good sense of humor and, and I find things very funny. And I, I, I have a real sense of, of irony. And so, you know, um, I was, I was uh, talking to a friend. There was a film that I did before I did um, Alone in the Dark. I did it almost like eight, eight years before. It was a, a short film called The Garden Party, which is an adaptation of a short story written in the 20s by Catherine Mansfield, very famous uh, Actually, she was Australian, but uh, lived, lived in England. And a, a, sort of about a young girl sort of coming to understand some things about life and death. Very kind of sensitive, arty kind of film, which is kind of the films that I thought I was going to end up doing. I never thought I'd end up making horror films. Um, and, uh, uh, and I showed it to this old, very old, old friend of mine that I had re reconnected with. And we were talking, you know, and, and she... She responded very, very well to it, but we had reset the film. It was set in the twenties. I reset it right after World War II. I, you know, I made it, made made some other changes, and we we had talked about that. And she also picked up some other things in the original story that that I never really picked up on. And I said that you know, basically, there were certain things in the story that really resonated with me, and those those were the things that I kind of. Uh, you know, brought out. I mean, as a director, you know, you're, you have a point of view, uh, you know, and, and this is what the film is about. You know, if you don't know what the film is about, and I don't mean the plot, I mean, you know, what is the film really about? What is the essence of this film that ties all the pieces together, that ties all the characters together? Um, and so, so for me with Elm Street, it was, um, uh, teenage sexual anxiety, you know, and Freddie kind of represented that. And so the whole, the whole thing about, uh, 
you know, the, the, the gay bar and a lot of the, the, the teasing. I mean, that's part of, uh, uh, you know, I mean, back in the day, um, you know, if you, sissy was another word for, for a gay person or a gay person might be called a sissy and it was very pejorative and gay people, you know, were still pretty much in, in the closet. I mean, you know, Mark did a whole documentary about that. Yeah. You know, that as soon as his, his agent said, Mark, you can't play straight. He quit, you know, I mean, it, you know, uh, I mean, it was obviously a lot more complicated than that, but, but, but um, you know, there was a great deal of homophobia. Um, you know, I mean, George Bush ran on the Defense of Marriage Act, you know, that we're going to, you can only be married, you know, to someone of the opposite sex. And 10 years later, you can be married to anybody you want in any state. In, I, I mean, it's, it's, it, there's been this incredible change. And when people came out of the closet suddenly, you know, I hate gay people but my brother's gay or my uncle's gay or my best friend is gay or my, you know, and suddenly you can't hate these people because they're all people that you know, and, and, and they're not just a, a stereotype anymore, you know? Yeah. And so that all, that all changed. But um, Elm Street was sort of made in this transitional period. Cause you know, I was living in Greenwich village in, in New York, which is sort of like the, 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 the there were a lot of gay bars and it was, a you know, uh, you know, that was the area, uh, Stonewall, the famous place where, where they had the Stonewall riots was about three blocks from, from, from where I lived. And in between Stonewall and before the AIDS epidemic hit, um, you know, it was really, in, in Greenwich Village, it was really just out on the street. And I used to go out to Fire Island and there were a couple of uh, communities there that, that, you know, that were known as, as, as as a gay community. So it was really very much out on the street. So that was like part of my daily life. And um, so, so a lot of that stuff uh, I kind of recognized and I thought some of it was, was uh, uh, you know, ripe for, for uh, um, a little bit of satire because, you know, most of my films have had, all of my films, you know, I would say have, have some humor and some social commentary and it's usually kind of uh, satirical and that's that's kind of my my uh, point of view so so yeah i mean all of those things were in there um you know people who say oh they didn't have a clue that there were any gay things i mean jesus christ <laughs> we, we shot in a famous gay bar in an s m stop and then you know they bought their their wardrobe in, in in the pleasure chest and stuff like that i mean you know we were aware of what was going on but i i i, I saw it from from a different perspective, you know, and and the whole kind of sexual bullying thing that 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 went on was was uh, you know part of it. You know, if Brad Pitt were sitting in the back of the bus in the opening scene, the girls wouldn't be giggling at him, you know. So, and um, um, you know, as far as my as far as my uh, reaction to the whole thing goes, um, you know, I. I made the film and the film ended up making a lot of money. And the next thing I knew I was in Hollywood and, you know, I directed films for the next, you know, 20, 20 years or so. Um, and, uh, and so I really didn't think much about it. You know, I didn't go back and screen it for myself or, you know, I just, I was, I was moving on. Um, and so um, I, I guess it was the, the, the 30th, uh, anniversary of the film yeah it was it was the 30th anniversary and there was a convention they asked me if I would go and I thought I thought it would be fun you know and I could make a few bucks signing autographs why not you know <laughs> I, and so I, I you know I hadn't seen Mark since since the rap party wow um, and and Mark and I were never close when we were shooting I mean we were we had a very good professional relationship but we had no personal relationship. I mean, we never talked about life. I don't think we sat and had lunch, you know, uh, m most of the time. We didn't stay in touch after the film was over. Uh, you know, Mark always seemed kind of out of sorts when, when we were shooting. And I think, uh, you know, I, I just attributed it to, well, maybe that's just part of his personality and maybe part of it is just, uh, you know, he's really into the character and the character's going through a lot of rough stuff. You know, I had no idea that his lover was dying of AIDS at the time. Mm. 
I had no idea of, of any of the other stuff, you know, that I, that I came to learn about, you know, after, after I, I reconnected with, 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 with Marx. I mean, my, 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 my initial reaction was, Hey, you know, <laughs> life, life, life goes on, uh, you know, and, and, and I've gotten to know Mark better and better. We, uh, we keep sort of bumping in. Well, I wouldn't say bumping into each other, but uh, we've done, I don't know, a half a dozen conventions together. Um, and he and I have really become really, really good, good friends. And, um, you know, uh, honestly, it's been, it's been a real pleasure for me to really get to know him. I mean, he's a really great guy. He's a really interesting guy. And I think, I, I think he may feel the same way toward, toward, toward me, that I think that he sees me as a more three-dimensional character. Um, I mean, it was, it was kind of funny because he had showed me this article that was in, in, in Fangoria that was, you know, ab about him and about the, the Scream Queen movie. And it, and it said, it said that, 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 that one of the, the key scenes in the film that really encapsulated the role of, of, of a gay man in a society was, was him sitting in the back of the bus feeling completely um, isolated and being laughed at, you know. Uh, and, and after I read the article, I said to Mark, uh, you know, when I was shooting that scene, I always thought that was me in the back of the bus. Because that was, you know, that was kind of how, how I grew up. You know, I always felt like, like an outcast. I always felt that I was different. And probably a lot of people that, that love horror films feel that way. I mean, I, mean uh, I think that's part of the appeal that, 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 that the fans have. So, so I think, um, uh, you know, it's been a really interesting journey and, and, and I don't really think, I understood Mark's point of view very well when we first started to talk about it. And I, we've had some very heavy conversations and, uh, you know, it's been, been very enlightening. So I'm, I'm uh, you know, it was never my intention to make a film that had a strong gay subtext and, and all that. But the film has been, um, you know, uh, very helpful to a lot of LGBT people. And they're able to kind of see characters who are, who are similar to them. And I think it's given um, some, some meaning to them and some pleasure to them. And so I'm, uh, uh, for me, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a very uh, great unexpected uh, consequence. Very good. Um, so to kind of reel it back a little bit, um, and just kind of, I have a little bit of a of a silly kind of question that I've just always wondered about. Um, in the second nightmare is the is the is the first one where we get uh, Freddy Krueger. His stripes go on the sleeves, and that has kind of been like an iconic, like like Nightmare Part Two was the first to really set the definitive look for Freddy Krueger. So I was wondering, was that just a thing that just kind of happened? Or was there like a discussion about getting like him a new uh, sweater with the stripes on the sleeves? Uh, was that, you know? Uh, I, you know what? I, I have no idea. Okay. I, I, had not, I had nothing to, to, uh, to do with that. Um, I mean, the, the New Line was concerned about certain things. You know, they wanted to make sure the film was scary and they wanted to make sure that Freddie was scary and mean and evil. And, um, you know, and they were very concerned about his look. So um, uh, they, they probably, and, and, and also they were, they were a lot more familiar with the whole character i mean i wouldn't say franchise because at that point it wasn't really a franchise but i mean they had lived through all the decisions that were made in the original film so they were very very aware of a lot of the details that i really wasn't i mean my my job was to basically you know go in there and direct the actors and and figure out where to put the camera and figure out how to tell this story and so a lot of the 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 um the smaller things, I really just didn't have the time to, you know, and, and, and also to execute the special effects in, in a way that was, you know, as, as believable as, as possible. Um, so a, a lot of things like, uh, you know, pe people talk about some of the props that were in the film. Um, 
uh, you know, some of them, which, which I, I, I approved and, you know, which, which they showed me like the Fu Manchu, uh, you know, cereal box and stuff like that. You know, they can, Hey, what do you think of this? Yeah. It looks, looks, looks cool. Good. But, but, um, I, when, when the set dressers dress the set, you know, they, they put tons and tons of stuff in there, you know, and, uh, um, you know, I, I, I basically just, you know, trusted, you know, if there was anything there that really caught my eye that really seemed, um, um, wrong, uh, you know, I, I would flag it, but I would, you know, wasn't, wasn't really overly, overly concerned about that. So actually the, the whole thing about the stripes on the sleeve, I have no idea. Okay. That's interesting to hear how like, uh, something like that just kind of just happens. Well, I mean, look, um, you know, if, if you're the director of the film, your main job is to tell the story with a, and which means you have to have a point of view and then you have to convey that point of view to everyone else. And then you have lots and lots of very creative people. You know, if you've hired the right people, you have people who are very, very good at what they do, you know, that are better at what they do than you could be at what they do. So you basically let them do their thing. You know, you, try to give everybody the same vision of where we're going. And then you let them do their, their thing. And then you, you kind of check up on them and say, well, this one doesn't quite fit into what I had in mind, but yeah, but uh, you know, all the rest of this, like, I mean, um, uh, working with, with Jacques Haitken, who's, you know, a really good, good cameraman. Um, uh, I was very, very specific about exactly where the cat, you know, what each shot was. I was, I'm, I'm very specific about what the camera is doing and what it's seeing and what lens is on the camera and all the rest of that. But I, I say almost nothing about the lighting. I leave the lighting to the DP because, you know, I, I really don't know how to light. Um, and I hire people that I, where, you know, I, I love the way they, they light. So I trust that they're going to do what's going to be good good for the film that they understand in a general sense where we're all going you know part of my job is to make sure that they understand that yeah absolutely i tell you what jack it's it's uh, been such a pleasure having you on um the film goes on to make 30 million dollars so we can kind of thank and blame you for six more sequels a legendary franchise if the financials don't go through we may never see a part three four five six seven freddy versus jason could could all be on the axe so we have you to thank for that or blame either one okay either 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 way you know what i get a nice check every year so hey that's that's what's important the house that freddie built new line cinema still uh still going today and to think it started with just four people in a room you being one of them it's really miraculous and thanks for for doing this with us and we hope we can catch up with uh, mark soon as well and hopefully he's uh doing better so hopefully things get back to normal here soon we can go back to you know uh, more in-person type type interviews and stuff like that. So hopefully we'll catch up soon, Jack. Thank you so much for doing this with us. We appreciate okay. it. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot.